Well, hello there. Thank you so much for looking in. It's nice to have your company today. Welcome to the Blue Files, the extended edition. On this series, we hope to really uh, talk about some of the more unique stories involving our changing planet, in many ways, how it weaves and connects to our daily lives. So we appreciate you joining us on this journey, and I'm thrilled to welcome back our West Coast contributor, Christina Stevens, back to the program. How are you? Great, thanks, Emma. Glad to be back. Lots of fun topics today. Very busy show. In fact, we're going to start uh, off by heading to an island. Now, I'd love to say it's a tropical one, but it's not. It's more uh, man-made. Tell me about this. It will be. Uh, you know, we throw around this word ambitious project all the time. Denmark's energy island truly is. They're planning on building an island off in the sea that will actually provide green energy by the time it's all up and running to more than the population of Denmark. Basically, they're calling it, it's a hub and spoke. So it's a, a giant platform, if you will, that'll be linked up to hundreds of wind turbines also in the sea all around it, gathering up all that energy and sending it back to shore. Initially, it'll provide about three uh, three gigawatts of power that's going to go up to 10 eventually so it's it's a huge project and and they expect again it'll take care of all of uh, Denmark's electric needs and even then they'll be able mm -hmm. to export some electricity they're also talking about making green hydrogen using the seawater I don't have any more specifics exactly how that works but that's mm -hmm. also part of the plan yeah, it was interesting, um, the, the fact that it wasn't just a wind turbine initiative here, right? As you mentioned, so they want to go and convert this into hydrogen, and then if they have everything, all their ducks uh, in a row, also liquid fuel. So it's a multi-platform uh, purpose here, which I think is what's needed, because... If you want to inspire other nations to follow suit, you have to show that, you know, this can work on so many levels. Oh, absolutely. And and when we say huge, they're talking about 120,000 square meters. That's about 12 city blocks. That's initially, oh. by the time it's all up and running eventually, uh, it'll yeah. be about triple that with about 600 uh, windmills out there in the sea. So, so whereabouts are they doing this then? Now you say in the sea, I'm assuming this is the North Sea? It is, but pretty much that's all they're saying. It's odd. They're being very coy. Mm -hmm. All they're saying is they've got a couple of possible locations, both 80 kilometers off the coast. Obviously, this is a very big project. It'll take time. The goal right now is 2030. So we'll see how that goes. You know, this is really quite something. I think it's a huge victory for climate change leadership. For those who don't know, uh, Denmark, uh, one of the richest nations in Europe, and primarily it's because of their fossil fuels, the exploration, uh, as you mentioned, in the sea. Uh, that's where they made a lot of money. So now they're saying, you know what? we need to get green we need to have this uh, eco initiative and it has to be bold so not only are they canceling any additional you know permits and that sort of thing allowing any more exploration but they also want to phase out what they have over the next couple of decades so i think this is fantastic oh exactly they're saying no more drilling gas all that kind of stuff and uh, it's it's also interesting the approach they're taking it's going to be at least half government owned and the rest private mm -hmm. to kind of keep some balance there and make sure that everyone's interests are supported, I guess. So when you said that uh, this will be connecting and possibly providing power into other nations, I guess that is also part of the strategy. And maybe that's why they haven't planned where it goes, because you're going to try, you mentioned spokes, connecting to give power to other nations. The spokes are the windmills to sort of the main island, if you will. Uh, they're talking about nations, possibly Germany, possibly the UK. That hasn't been ironed out yet. Uh, they do seem to have these two locations kind of narrowed down. It's just they're kind of being a little vague. 80 kilometers off the coast, if you want to go looking around the North Sea, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, again, it's such a large initiative, but listen, I think it's fantastic, and there will be updates, and we're going to keep uh, watching that without question. We're going to keep with the power theme, though, and talk about a supercharge, and I think a real clever idea for uh, EV owners, electric vehicle ownership, and believe it or not, this got its start up from the TV show Shark Tank, of all places. Uh, Mark Cuban, a big investor, he's putting in, uh, last I read, about $5 million. But the company's now creating the world's first mobile, ultra-fast charging network. So it's almost akin to CAA, and for American uh, viewers, uh, AAA, uh, where, you know, if you get stranded on a roadway, you maybe need your, your tire fix. More importantly, maybe you need gas. Well, this is the solution 
if your battery dies in your EV uh, car, your electric vehicle. Uh, so you need a quick charge. So basically the premise is that you have the app and once you uh, log into the app, it obviously knows through GPS uh, and satellite coordination where you are and it will determine how much of a charge you need to get to a conventional wired hub, if you will. Um, so I think it's quite fascinating and it seems simple but it is going to be the trend going forward. Oh, absolutely. It only makes sense. I, I'm almost surprised uh, Elon Musk didn't come up with it himself when before now, right? Wouldn't you expect that? Uh, He's going to clone it, I think. He's going to do his own version. They, they better be careful. Um, <laughs> so, so paint a picture for me. You're, you're on the side yeah. of the road because the battery's dead. So they come out. Like, how long are you going to be sitting there? How does that, how does it work? Well, as I understand it, they have patented this technology where they've made battery packs. I, I want to say almost the size of a suitcase, a medium-sized suitcase. And they're modular, so they can stack them up. And they have this technology that they have, so it's like on a wheeling cart, um, pretty well. For every mile that you need to get to that wired network will take about a minute. So say you're 30 miles away from, you know, a rest stop that has a charging station, you'll have to sit there for 30 minutes and they will literally uh, boost your battery up with these modular packs. Now, the interesting thing is they said that their technology is about eight times faster, though, than a conventional wired network. So maybe you always have to have a, either, you know, a book in your glove box or a Sudoku on your iPhone. When the, the guy or girl comes to boost up your car, you just sort of relax and then off you go. Um, but, you know, the, the extension from this, Christina, I don't know if you have an EV vehicle. I'll, I keep saying EV vehicle. EV. Um, it's redundant. I don't. But that is going to be the trend. Uh, you know, certainly as we look at some of the nations around the world, Everything is moving away from internal combustion engines. Uh, Canada and the U.S., so they're phasing out. They're saying now by 2035. But in Norway, it's, it's 2025. So we're only four years away. In fact, they're saying 60% of the vehicles purchased now are EV. So this is certainly going to be, I think, a huge success, not only in North America, but likely uh, maybe through Elon's uh, you know, money and ingenuity around the world. Uh, but really fascinating thing. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And the other part they're looking at, too, is hydrogen power is another direction they're going with vehicles mm -hmm. instead of just electric. When you, when you say the battery pack, though, I have visions of a futuristic, you know, Superman running around with his jetpack and his battery pack, and he's gonna come charge her. <laughs> that may come. It might. That may, maybe, maybe my kids, they'll see that. Uh, you know, who knows where it goes. For now, it's uh, locked into four different cities, uh, including Chicago, LA, San Diego, and San Francisco. They've also partnered with Allstate. They see uh, certainly a future in this. But you can bet it is only going to uh, magnify, especially with the demand of EVs. I mean, this is just going to be part of, of, of the normal routine, I think. And I think it's also a step in the right direction. So good stuff there. Spark charge. Now, from there, we're going to move off uh, into, this is kind of cool, to southern England. And we're going to meet the world's most sustainable soccer club. They are called the Forest Green Rovers Away. <laughs> See, I'm on the superhero, <laughs> forest green <laughs> rovers. So you don't really associate, you know, European soccer, football uh, clubs yeah. with, with green, right? A lot of us in North America see more of a, you know, the hooligan kind of thing. But there is an yeah. entrepreneur who has this football club and he is so committed to making it green. Uh, they already have things like the entire club is powered by renewables on match game day um all of the food offered up is vegan their their pitch as they call it we would call it a soccer field uh is is it's organic they have electric mm -hmm. mowers it's recycled water so now now they're going to recycling coffee bean waste to make their actual mm -hmm. uniforms so they're actually going to be wearing or they have even tried the coffee bean waste uniforms yeah. so really when you think about it, um you know the the polyester wow. the wicking wear most of us like and they right. use for uniform yeah. it's all plastic all of it so they thought what right. can we do they tried bamboo they thought that was great how can we make yeah. it better so they're trialing these these uniforms that are made out of three cups of coffee bean waste and five plastic bottles so i guess you have a recipe you mix it up and away you go they're saying they're actually lighter and more comfortable yeah these these recycled uniforms than yeah. uh, than the standard stuff out there so it's, it's looking good 
and, and it keeps you charged like a Red Bull. Was, <laughs> no, my first, thought, my first thought was the locker rooms. If only they could keep that sort of a coffee smell so that the locker rooms don't yes, smell fresh ground. bad, sweaty athletes, right? You go and you're like, mm, coffee. Oh, man. A nice cafe instead of a sweaty locker room. You know, this is really fascinating. So you're saying they have broken it down per jersey. And yep. sorry, what was it? Three cups of coffee? Uh, and five <laughs> coffee bean oh, waste bean coffee bean waste, waste uh, yes. and five plastic bottles and away you go <laughs> isn't that something well i you, they're getting a trophy in my books uh, and you know it's interesting because um, there's a whole shift now. United Nations have, have listed this as uh, the sports for climate action. And, and it's because mainly you can have a lot of influence on millions of people exactly. through the love of a certain exactly. sport, right? Uh, and, and, you know, some fans, I mean, they are fans. So whatever you can incorporate and inspire through your platform, whatever the sport happens to be, it's very likely some of it will be carried forward by the fans of the team. Um, so the, the principles for the UN driven initiative, some of them include greater environmental responsibility, but also education for climate action. So I think this certainly fulfills that. And and who knows? I mean, I, I would imagine that this is just the beginning for them. Is there more? Have they sort of revealed where else they want to go with this? Of course, they want to have an electric team bus and eventually uh, right. build a stadium that's eco-friendly and all wood. Now that's obviously a big project and some time away, but they're looking wow. at how they could do that. And as you mentioned, influencing people, they're saying other, I mean, FIFA has called them the greenest team, uh, the greenest mm -hmm. football club, and uh, other teams are starting to follow suit. You know, they have to keep up. And I can't That's even right. imagine, I was just thinking as you were saying that, you know, you have somebody who, who you know, dedicated carnivore, and they go to this game, they would never otherwise try something <laughs> vegan. And who knows, they might actually say, hey, this is good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. As simple and as that. And they may not. And they may not. <laughs> <laughs> they might say, see, I've been proven right all along. This Get ain't a hot dog. <laughs> going home to the barbecue, right? Yeah. I mean, it, absolutely. But, you know, at least yeah. introducing these ideas right. or showing people how doable it is and that, mm -hmm. you know, you still have this beautiful soccer field you're looking at. So I, I have, a, I have a, a pitch for FIFA. Maybe in addition to, you know, the yellow card as a warning and the red card, they should give them yeah. a green card green bonus card. points. They give them a green card. Yep. I love that idea. Yep. Well, maybe that'll be a new thing, uh, especially if this team is leading the charge on that. I need to you trademark know, you mentioned it. A, I'm going to trademark yeah, it maybe, right now. Green yeah, card, it's yeah, mine. That's it. It was discovered here on the Blue Files. <laughs> that's right. You mentioned the wooden stadium. Um, I don't think that's, some may say that's impossible, but there are already some companies. In fact, out in your neck of the woods on the West Coast, of actually building high rises using wood instead of standard concrete. Um, so there are some companies that are starting to do that because one of the biggest problems uh, when you're building a structure, the concrete, the carbon to make concrete is just unbelievable. So who knows? It, it, maybe it, it, it'll be sooner than you think that there'll be a completely wooden stadium. And this is, again, another shift. And I think, a, as we mentioned off the top, that the influence, the inspiration, um, it shows that if you're looking for a solution of creating a solution, it's there. And I think that's what it's all about. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have questions about that. How do you build it so big? Where, do the, where does the wood come from? Is, is it sustainable? Yeah. And fireproofing, it kind of, you know, but there can be benefits. Yeah, no, true. You know, you mentioned yeah. out on the West Coast, uh, things have to be earthquake proof. I feel like wood has mm -hmm. more give. Concrete goes down. I'm not obviously an architect or an engineer, but uh, there, there could, it could be better in some yeah. ways. Well, and that's something that we will continue to follow here. Now, before we wrap up, uh, I don't want to give too much away of this, but I know you're putting together an article for our Big Blue Marble newsletter, which we send out every month. Uh, it's free to your inbox, and of course, you can subscribe at bigbluemarble.earth. But this story is about uh, a Colombian drug lord's love of animals. So don't give away too much, but just give us a little highlight, please. Okay, we've pretty much all heard of Pablo Escobar and his yeah. uh, cocaine business made him one of the wealthiest men in the mm. world, and one of his hobbies was was keeping a zoo with all kinds of exotic animals, including hippos. Now, mm -hmm. the result many years later is really hurting Colombia. And we'll tell you why we're not talking about guns. We're not talking about cocaine. It's the hippos that he has left behind that are now leaving their mark on Colombia. 
Well, we look forward to getting that update. And again, for those who'd like to uh, read that and many more stories, again, go to bigbluemarble.earth. Now, if you're enjoying what you're seeing, show some love. Uh, this is how we build the channel. Give us a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe. The button's on the bottom there. And also, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And don't forget, every Friday, the Here and There show. We stream live at various locations. Uh, and it starts at noon each and every Friday on my Facebook page. Christina, thank you so much for joining us again. I look forward to next week. Thank you. Me too. We'll have some interesting ones. All right. Christina Stevens, our West Coast contributor on another edition, Episode 2 here of The Blue Files, Extended Edition. Have a great day, everybody.